I'll just talk about the, the project. It's an enlightening talk anyway, so 10 minutes to just introduce it. My name is Joe. Um, I'm Italian and I spent the last 10 years in Cork. Uh, and uh, as you just learned, I work for Hulux, where I've done all sorts of things. Uh, Loki.js is an in-memory data store. I just want to explain how I, I got there. I'm not into reinventing the wheel. In-memory data stores exist all over the place. But I was working on a um, uh, phone gap, uh, Cordova project, and I was faced with the problem of saving data locally and then resuming uh, state across sessions. And what happened is that the natural kind of obvious solution for that is to use SQLite or whatever plugin that interfaces um, PhoneGap with, with SQLite. But I wasn't satisfied with that at all because, um, as I understand, we, uh, Kirk Dev is big into JavaScript, and uh, so am I. And for you to write a program in JavaScript and then having to resort to SQL to retrieve your data, especially in a mobile application where you might have, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 records. It just seems like extremely cumbersome and it's not intuitive. So um, I thought, why, why don't I write something that, that does that for me in a, uh, something very minimalistic that would do the job? And, and so Loki was born. The reason why I called it Loki is that, as you may or may not know, Loki is the Norse god of uh, mischief, even though Marvel tries to depict it as an evil god. He's just up to stuff. <laughs> In the original myths, he even helps Thor out, uh, up to the point where he's bored, then he starts uh, <laughs> causing mess. So um, I thought it quite mischievous to develop a, ja a database in JavaScript. Um, my second slide was Doctor Who saying what? Uh, he was very skeptical. Um, so um, the result was actually quite amazing um, because Node.js made um, something like a database written in JavaScript a reality. And I found that the performance was actually, was actually great. Um, uh, so, first of all, no, Loki.js works in memory, so in memory is faster than input output from, from disk, uh, and that's great. Uh, you're writing an application in JavaScript, Loki.js uses JavaScript to create your data, to read your data, to filter your data, whatever you want to do, it's JavaScript. So you don't, let, you don't need to move off to something else, you don't need to, I don't know, if you work with, with, with Java or PHP or whatever, back-end language, you will have your object relational mappers and all that. That's fine. That they 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 let you get away with using SQL, but you know, levels of abstraction and all that. Uh, Loki is just plain JavaScript. It just works off um, Node.js. Um, and lastly, um, I decided, uh, merely out of uh, laziness to um, store the data in JSON, or JSON, whatever pronunciation people adopt these days, um, which is a, a very important point, um, because in hindsight, I actually thought about the fact that you can just dump this JSON, and then you can translate it in whatever other system you're going to use one day, because it's just plain data that you can load up in whatever other application. So that made Loki.js cross-platform, cross-application uh, compatible, whereas you know there's, there's databases out there that use um, JavaScript for their interface um, of choice, like for example MongoDB or CouchDB, but you can't take the MongoDB data that's on your disk and plug it into CouchDB, at least not straight out. So um, that made it very, very portable. Um, and as I said, last point on the slide, you're, you're writing JavaScript, you love JavaScript, why would you go and use some other language for your database? So um, at this stage, um, the selling points of Loki.js are that it's compatible with browser and, and node.js. 
Um, I initially wrote Loki.js for a Cordova application, so it, it literally had to be injected with your classic script tag into uh, a HTML file. So I thought, look, I'm going to make it no compatible uh, in, a, on, in a second phase, but initially it has to be compatible with a, with a, with a browser. Uh, and so it is, and therefore, for that reason, you can use it as a, a, a in in web page uh, database, and it's available on Bower. So if you're into uh, client side package management, and obviously on npm, uh, it persists on disk, which is important because okay, in memory is great, but you you want to be able to resume state across sections uh, sessions. Uh, it has an extremely low footprint. Now, um, I should mention that there, there are other products on, 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 on the web that do something similar to that. Um, when I explored them about a year ago, I, I, I wasn't really happy with the alternatives, which were uh, the likes of TaffyDB, PouchDB, and NEDB, which is a, a kind of um, MongoDB API compatible in memory database. Um, so I started writing uh, Loki.js and I found that, like, for example, PouchDB proves itself uh, of being only 34 kilobytes. Loki is under 4, 3.8. Um, and it, without doing uh, any bold statements, it destroys <laughs> the other ones in, in terms of performance. Also because probably it offers a little less in terms of functionality, so you're, you're not complicating your life as much. But the um, biggest selling point in terms of performance is that day one, I was really tempted to just create a massive object, JavaScript object, and, and use properties for the index. You know? So property A is index A, and, and index my data like, like that. Instead, I went down a very, uh, a much less simple route, that of using a binary search tree algorithm, and and that meant that um, find operations, especially if you know the index, are lightning fast, like my talk. So uh, the other uh, big selling point of Loki.js is that it uses no SQL jargon, which JavaScript people are much more accustomed to. I mean, I, I love SQL as well. And don't, this is not a crusade in, against anybody. But if you're working with JavaScript and you talk about documents and collections, it just is much more intuitive and natural uh, than talking about tables and, and stuff. Um, it's completely dependency free. Um, actually, in the last couple of weeks, I added a dependency on a tiny minimalistic um, testing package, which I wrote myself, so uh, practically it is uh, completely um, uh, dependency free. I had a, a very nice um, screen in which to show a sample usage, but I could actually uh, voice it out loud. You just create a new Loki database and pass the name of the file where you're, you're saving your data and then call add collection to create a new collection and insert to create a, a new objects. It's, it's just that simple. Mm -hmm. um, moving on, because I think my time is running out. Um, we've got, I say we, not because I'm plur <coughs> plurale magistatis, whatever the name is. It's because I've got a, uh, uh, a three months or so, um, Mr. Dave Easterday hailing from Virginia in the US is helping me out with, with Loki.js. He liked the, the, the project, so um, he joined. Um, we've got two styles of querying the data. One is Mongo style, so if, you, if you've got in mind the Mongo interface, you pass an object literal, which kind of queries the objects and returns the result. Uh, we've got a number of operator, operators supported, the usual equal greater than, greater than, uh, and equal less than, and so on. And that's one way of querying data. The other way is to create views, much like CouchDB. The, um, this is actually the idiomatic way for Loki.js in that um, 
it, it basically you create a persistent filter that uh, is uh, kept alive in the background. And if you operate an insert or, or an update or a delete, that view is also updated. So whenever you want to retrieve that particular subset of data that you created in the first place, you don't need to go and keep it in sync or refresh or anything. Loki.js does that for you. Um, it, you take a hit in performance initially because it is a little more complicated to uh, create that subset of data, but um, then retrieving it is extremely fast. Because obviously, imagine if you have a, your database with a million records and you create a subset that only con contains 10. Um, you only query that, those 10 records, instead of going through the entire thing again. Uh, we've got a Fluent API. So name of the collection, call a method called chain, and then you, you call other methods such as find where, simple sort, and then call data to retrieve your data. And I would say that very quickly, I don't think I'll have time for questions and answers. Um, so I'll just say that the project is available on GitHub, and it has a website, lockyjs.org. Um, the roadmap at the moment is very ambitious in that I'm, I'm writing a TCP and HTTP wrappers for, for, for Loki.js, so it can actually run as a standalone data store on a dedicated machine. Um, uh, obviously, we're aiming for replication and horizontal scaling. And um, I've also been looking into multi-threading with JX Core. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the project. Uh, it basically is, if you have in mind the Node.js architecture, um, whenever you run a program, there's a, a V8 instance, the, the, the engine that, 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 um, that runs underneath. Basically, um, multi-threading with JX Core is basically done by instantiating different uh, V8 instances, and there's some secret mechanism whereby memory is shared across instances, but then brought back to the to the process that initially spawned those uh, those threads. So it's interesting because Node has this kind of uh, uh, drawback, if you want, of not being able to support uh, threads. So we'll see how that goes. Um, <coughs> again, if you have any questions, I'm um, hanging around for a bit. So. Yeah, well, we can, take, we can take a couple of questions now, if you like. Don't OK. Does anybody have a few questions? Uh, yeah. <coughs> at, at which point do you persist? Um, how is it done, the, the persisting rationale? Basically, uh, I thought. When do you need it? When you operate an insert, an update, or a delete. And at the moment, we have it with a, with a set timeout. So <coughs> the, the process will operate that update when, there's, you know, when the processor actually has time for it. Um, as we perceive that there is no urgency um, in, in, in uh, persisting the data to, to disk, it's much more important to give the data back to the user if they were operating a query. But as soon as the pro processor is, is free to do that, it does it on insert, update, update, and delete. And could you persist to local storage or, or WebSQL or something? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm actually, I know we've got a fence, fancy Helm's Deep background, but I wanted to show you um, Sandbox developed by Dave, the other collaborator that has um, uh, persistence on WebSQL working. So uh, yeah, it's actually um, working really well, I have to say. Anybody else? OK, great. Thank you very much.